When I was a grade school student, around nine or ten, my mother read to me and my younger sister, Jane Goodall's In the Shadow of Man. And I was so impressed by it and so interested in it. As a nine or ten year old, I actually wrote Dr. Goodall, and she wrote me back. I actually have this letter carefully tucked away in my original hardbound copy of In the Shadow of Man. Over the years, after I sort of left anthro well, I never left anthropology, but I didn't enter it as an 11-year-old. But when I eventually entered it as a uh, college student at Cornell, and ultimately went to Harvard, and now at New York University, I've actually carried out research on chimpanzees. My lab was the lab that actually defined the fourth subspecies of chimpanzees, Pantroglodytes velarosus, based on some of the things that uh, Dr. Goodall had written. And most recently, in fact, just a month and a half ago, while I was sitting at home suffering from the swine flu, I had to Skype in a thesis defense for the new Dr. Kate Detweiler, who carried out all of her research in Gombe National Park um, on Gwen and monkeys, not on the chimpanzees. But so I feel I have a deep connection to both Dr. Goodall, the Leakey Foundation, or the Leakeys, and on. And in fact, in one of my television shows on Animal Planet, I sequenced Jane Goodall's hair and compared it to Frodo. Um, I didn't get to meet her at the time. I only got to hold her hair with a tweezers wearing a pair of latex gloves. But three years ago at the IPS meetings in Uganda, I actually got to finally meet her in person and have tea with her, sort of culminating my voyage into this field. So, again, I feel sort of a deep connection to many of the strains going on here. Dr. Goodall, the Leakeys, the Foundation, and so on. But today I want to talk about sort of something that might seem esoteric, and that is actually dating the events in primate evolution. So I'm not going to really be talking about evolutionary trees. Most of us who study DNA and sequence DNA are trying to figure out who is related to whom. We've actually not finished that project, but we've worked out most of it within the order primates. We know, at least at the generic level, who's related to whom. We're now out at the twigs of the tree. Is what I'm now becoming more and more interested in is integrating that knowledge with the fossil record, you know, the other entire half, if not two thirds, of our field. And that requires us to figure out when these divergences, when we split, or when different lineages split from each other. And so that's one part of molecular systematics that I'm going to sort of concentrate on today. A micro background, though, to this is that any sequence of DNA, any gene, any allele, or any variant you have it, ultimately can be traced back in time to a common ancestor. This could be African Eve 200,000 years ago. This could be Lucy or Artie. This could be a slime mold on the floor of your shower if you go back two billion years ago. But any segment of our genome ultimately has a common ancestor back in time. Now, to actually figure out who we are most closely related to and maybe when that common ancestor was, we have to do a series of complex calculations and inferences and modeling that I am not going to go into at all here. Just suffice it to say, using DNA sequences, we can infer the actual relationships of who's most closely related to whom and how many mutations separate them. But because of some very insightful insights, of um, people in the past, we were able to actually put dates on those events. But one of the things I want to mention is how much this field has advanced in the last 10 to 20 years. 
Back in the ice ages when I walked uphill through the snow both ways to school in 1992, I sequenced DNA manually. Almost nobody in this room knows what it's like to work with radioactivity and x-ray films and auto rads and look at four simultaneous reactions and try to figure out what a DNA sequence is. My students today have it made as I'll make it clearer and clearer. But one of the reasons I have extraordinarily confidence some of my paleontological colleagues call it arrogance in the results that we can now gain, is if I go back to those dark ages between 89 and 92 at Harvard, I collected a gene from the mitochondrial genome that was 684 bases long in eight different species of monkeys. So call that 700 times 8, you know. I collected 5,600 bases of DNA sequence and got a Harvard PhD. I found some very groundbreaking, interesting results, enough to actually be hired at NYU as an associate or assistant professor without doing a postdoc. In fact, the dirty secret is they hired me before I wrote a single word of my thesis, but I still wrote it, defended it, completed it in time so that I could start there that following summer. But I, I worked on a series of old world monkeys that I'll come back to um, in just a moment. But again, I collected 5,600 bases of data. Part of my talk tonight, I'm going to be talking about I, I actually forgot the number. I think it's 18 different species of primates for which we already have collected the entire genome, all 3.3 billion bases of data, or we're nearly complete in doing that. So the very last few pieces of data I'm going to show you, or very fast results I'm going to show you, are going to be based on you know, 40 or 50 billion bases of data, not 5,600. Hence my arrogance in thinking we're getting closer to some of these results. And so is what I want to talk about for the rest of the evening is how we can convert these masses of data into interesting answers to interesting questions. When did the macaques and baboons last share a common ancestor? And that's actually going to be one of my first examples. When did the orangutan join the ape, gorilla, and human lineage? When did the old world monkeys and African apes diverge? And one of the really interesting questions is, when did the primates first appear? And I'm going to try to answer those um, tonight through a series of different examples. Two years after I was born, Linus Pauling and Emil Zuckercandle published a famous paper that basically established our field. They noticed that amino acid sequences seemed to evolve at an almost steady rate. So not a perfectly steady rate, but sort of like carbon-14 dating. You know, we've all heard of the half-life of a molecule, so you can't predict exactly when one molecule will become the other, but over time, over, I think it's 5,400 and something years, half of those molecules decay. Well, it turns out mutations in genes that aren't under intense selection um, or parts of the genes that I won't say aren't important but aren't going to directly and immediately affect the organism seem to occur at a very sort of steady rate. And they said, well, if these changes between organisms are occurring at a steady rate, and we can calculate that rate because we know when two model organisms split from each other, let's say they split from each other 10 million years ago, and we observe 100 mutations between them, 
maybe 10 mutations occur per million years. And then we could extrapolate if we see two organisms that were 200 mutations apart, maybe that was 20 million years. So this was the foundation of the molecular clock hypothesis. So the molecular clock hypothesis is now over, it's as old as I am actually, but it turns out as all brilliant early discoveries, even Newtonian physics has been overturned by relativity, it was close, it was a good approximation, but it wasn't quite right, it wasn't the full amount of the story. And that's the complexity I want to try to get to tonight. Because it turns out our genome isn't this simple singular entity. We have 46 individual chromosomes in every one of our nuclei. Every one of us has 100 to 1,000 mitochondria in our cells, each of which have multiple genomes of themselves. So we have different components of our genome and they actually biologically act a little differently from each other. And so it turns out if we want to convert information from part of our genome, what can be called a gene tree, into a species tree, it's complicated. All of biology turns out to be complicated. So if you have variation in an ancestral population, and I guarantee you if I look across this room right now, I can pick almost any gene in our genome and we have differences amongst us. But depending upon that ancestral population, some of those variants might have ended up in one species and other in another. And if we actually trace the individual stretch of DNA's history, we could end up with an actual different view of the species. The best example I use with this with my students is think of your own history. You have a family tree from your mother and you have your family tree from your father. Might have, one might have come from Lebanon, one might have come from Belarus. What are you? You're a combination of both of them. You don't have a singular history. Your two parents have different histories. Their two parents have different histories. Each of those histories is an accurate reconstruction of your history, but it's only a small component of it. If we break down the genome, we actually have to look at this history chromosome by chromosome, mitochondria by mitochondria, in fact, even gene by gene or region of gene by gene within, the, within those genomes. An example of this was published in 2006 by my colleagues of David Reich and Nick Patterson. So they looked at the human and chimp genomes. The chimp genome had just been published shortly before this and they analyzed the complete human and chimp genome and said they have a really complex history. And if we look at and infer the divergence times, we count up the number of mutations, we apply that mutation rate, it turns out each chromosome gave you a different answer. First of all, this should not have been surprising because just like the chromosome you inherited from your father from Belarus is different from the chromosome you inherited from your mother, each of our chromosomes might be inherited from a different ancestor. And those ancestors will have appeared at different times in history. So they said you can calculate the average genetic distance and convert it into time for the whole genome, but they're sort of a minimum date. So that might be the average distance between you and some other person you pick at random in this crowd, but some of your chromosomes are going to be more closely related. If there's two people here from Belarus, 
you're going to be more closely related at that chromosome than at others. But, you know, if one of you is from, you know, Lagos and one of you is from somewhere else, they're going to be more distantly related. So usually in science we deal with averages, but here we have to look at not just the average, but basically the minimum or the latest that we shared two common ancestors. And this is something we refer to as the most recent common ancestor. So in a really complex discussion, they pointed out that humans and chimpanzees are more closely related to each other, just as Jane Goodall pointed out, than say chimpanzees are to gorillas or that we are gorillas. So you could say we are either chimps or chimps are humans. Either of those would be an equally valid statement if we were Martian biologists. Um, but we're not. We're humans full of hubris. Um, but some of our genes actually link humans and gorillas because we share a distant ancestry with gorillas and some of our genes link gorillas and chimpanzees. Um, so these particular authors came up with a complex theory that said humans and chimpanzees and I, I rose to the bait. Science, as I, I gave an analogy at the high school today, it's much like the mafia. There's personal and there's business. I can say, that's the stupidest hypothesis I ever heard to, to my very best friend, and it has no effect on our friendship whatsoever. That's business. So I said, these guys got it all wrong and published a paper on it because their scenario was that humans and chimps split a little over six million years ago but continued to interact and hybridize until you know another million and a half years they continued to interbreed with each other I said this is a mis fundamental misinterpretation of evolution because, as with our grandparents and great-grandparents, every gene has its own unique history and therefore its own time of most recent common ancestry with that found in another individual. And so there is inherently a spread of ancestry. There's not a point at X million years we were completely split from this other group. It's because, you know, there might have been some hanky-panky in that village and there's a little more inbreeding than we thought and so that's going to be a recent event and then there's going to be some of these ancient histories. So finding a million and a half year spread across the chromosomes of human and chimpanzees to me was completely unexpected or I'm um, completely expected and that was sort of my criticism and critique of this particular paper because there is no such thing as a molecular clock I like to refer to it as the molecular swatch each region of the genome each lineage of animals Rats and mice evolve at different rates than monkeys and apes. In fact, old world monkeys and apes evolve at different rates than each other, something I'll show in just a moment. So we can't apply that global average. We have to go to the individual neat-looking design. We have to look at the gene within a particular lineage to try to tease apart this history. The problem, though, is with any watch or with any timepiece is you have to calibrate it. You have to set it. You know, if I set my watch wrong, it will, I actually have a really nice atomic calibrated watch here, but if I set it wrong, it's always going to be wrong. So here's where molecular arrogance has to join with the collegiality of our paleontological friends.
because we actually rely on the fossil record to set those swatches. And so there's several premises, though, to setting this clock, to getting your time right. So you might, you know, if you're a bunch of Navy SEALs about to jump out of a plane and you all set your watch together, all five of you might be exactly have the same time, but it might not be the time there on the ground. So if you're rendezvousing with somebody at noon and your watch says 11.50, even though all five of you agree, it's still not going to be a very useful calibration. So in any statistical approach to anything, you always want to try to interpolate your data. You want to surround, if I want to estimate X, if I have an estimate of A and an estimate of B, X falls somewhere between them. I might be a little off towards A or B in one direction, but this is the very best thing you could possibly do. If I want to estimate X here, and I have A way out here, this extrapolation could be wildly off. If these species are rodents, and they're evolving very rapidly, and I estimate the rate of evolution based out here, I, it tells me nothing about the rate of evolution out here. So you have to be very careful. So whenever possible, if we have a good fossil calibration point, a really contentious issue, we want to try to make sure we're interpolating it. And I'm going to give some counterexamples or some bad examples of using poor interpolation and poor extrapolation and try to show how my research group has gotten around that. So, the fossil record is fickle. Inherently so. We all would like to think when we find a fossil, fossil C, it's right there at the split between our two groups. But you know what? C could be here. This could be our coelacanth. <laughs> and we could be off by 200 million years because there's swimming coelacanths in Indonesia and Madagascar. And if we found a 10,000-year-old coelacanth fossil, we wouldn't realize that they go back hundreds of millions of years. So if you have a single fossil, it could be right at your split point. What's the chance of being that lucky? Infinitesimally small. It's somewhere after the split point. But what it does tell you is that they did split at least by that time. So it gives you one bound. It gives you an upper bound on your estimate. The problem is the lower bound is C here, 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 or all the way back here. So now, if you have two fossils, one on each of the two lineages you're interested in, again, they could be way up here. But what's the probability you're so unlucky that both of them are missing half of the fossil record? Actually, pretty great. So that's not that helpful. The perfect situation, which I don't think has yet arisen, is which you have multiple fossils that are close to the calibration point, clearly before it, and many other fossils so that if there's, you've got a whole lot of fossils from this time period of a whole bunch of things, it's less likely that you've completely missed an entire lineage. We're fortunate in the order primates that because, again, of our anthropocentrism or our hubris, I like to think, that we've searched more carefully and intently for primate fossils than, you know, for, you know, cow fossils. Uh, I hope there's no artiodactyl experts here in the audience. Uh, cows are perfectly wonderful animals. I eat them several times a week. Um, but, so we're pretty lucky with the primate fossil record. But again, you have to use it properly. And as I said already, rodents evolve at different rates from cows and from primates and from carnivores. 
And so we can't just assume the molecular clock is ticking like a metronome. We have to realize there's jazz, there's rock, there's baroque, that they're evolving at different rates. And we need to essentially correct for those rates over evolutionary time. So without going into the excruciating complex details of Bayesian statistics and all of that stuff, I'll just assert we now have pretty good analytical, statistical, and probabilistic ways for correcting for the different rates. If you know rodents are twice as fast as primates, then you have the number that you find in rodents, and then you can reasonably compare rodents and primates. I'll give an example of that in a moment. Um, rather, again, than boring you to death with lots and lots of slides and details, my grad students and I, newest methods at our meetings, on our posters and in our talks, is rather than going through detailed things of how we did everything, we just show a quick flow chart. <laughs> we just say, we did all of these things and got to here. Um, and anybody who wants to can see the program name we use, the technique we use, the parameters we use. But for this audience, I don't think you want to know what the priors I used in my Bayesian analysis were. So let me give several now examples of how we and others have applied um, molecular clock or better molecular swatch techniques. I realize I actually have to buy like four of them and wear two on each wrist for talks like this in the future. The first example I want to give is within the great apes and the split between the apes and the old world monkeys. And I'm going to concentrate on the split between the apes and the old world monkeys and the split between humans and chimpanzees. So I'm actually not anthropocentric. I'm monkey-pocentric. Uh, the chemists and physicists and biologists at NYU actually call me monkey boy. Uh, because most of what we study are old world monkeys and new world monkeys. But I'm going to show you some lemurs and lorises as well. So <clears throat> recently, in another nice example of business versus personal, one of my former students published a paper which we severely critiqued and we still go out and have drinks several times a year in New York. He's now a professor at Hunter College. And they made what I consider to be a fundamental error in trying to, in, in this case, they were validly trying to interpolate the data rather than necessarily extrapolate it. The problem was they used a bad fossil calibration point. Your watch is only going to be as accurate as when you set it. And so they looked at the human and fossil record, and it's darn reasonable to say humans and chimps probably split around six million years ago based on the fossil record. We have definitive, like already, hominin fossils. We have maybes. And then we have maybe slightly befores. So this is almost that last scenario I showed in one of the previous slides. But then they used baboons and macaques. Not because they have a good fossil record, but because they have good genetic data. If you're going to use molecular data, though, to do this, you are so dependent on the fossil record, you have to pick the thing you have the best fossil record for, not the thing you have the most DNA sequence for. It's easier to generate DNA sequence than to find fossils. Paleontologists in the audience, I'm sure, would agree. It turns out baboons and macaques fossil record is much like that second column where C is about halfway up. And so they calibrated this to about five or six million years. We now know from numerous other 
analyses that it's really about 10 million years. So this was just one of those really unfortunate cases in which we only knew the last half of the fossil record and but by setting our watch to that, they're 10 minutes too early or 10 minutes too late to the rendezvous. And the evidence for that is, so here's their calibration points, um, around 6 million years uh, for human and chimp, maybe 6.5 million years. But they put some of these other dates extraordinarily old. For instance, 88 or 97 million years for the split between Tarsiers, uh, Anthropoids, and the Strepsirines. This would actually put the order Primates back over 100 million years. Um, so here's their tree. But again, it's completely predicated on a date that's about half too young here. And we know their date is off because we have other species within here for which we do have fossils, which their estimate then gives a date of two and a half million years for the split between two types of baboons who we have four million year old fossils. The fossil evidence in that case absolutely trumps the molecular estimate and tells you the molecular estimate is wrong. A second example is the example of extrapolation. So my colleague Ulfar Arnesen in his work group in Sweden calibrated their molecular trees with the split between cow and whale around 60 million years ago and based on when cows and whales split are trying to describe when humans and chimpanzees split. Whoops, I'm sorry. They actually get a human chimp split between 10 and 13.7 million years old. Cows and whales evolve at a different rate than humans do. So by extrapolating from so far outside the order primates, they ended up with incredibly ancient dates that are just completely untenable from everything else we know. How do you fix it? You work at NYU. So several of my grad students and a colleague from SUNY Albany and I sequenced complete mitochondrial genomes of a whole bunch of old world monkeys and apes. And previous molecular estimates, I will fully admit, I didn't make them, but they were wacko and off. Anywhere from 21.5 million years ago, based on the eta globin gene, all the way back to somewhere between 47 and 74 million years ago, based on mitochondrial DNA, based on the previous author that I just showed you. And similar dates for uh, the human chimp split, all the way from uh, 3.8 million years ago, all the way back to 14 million years ago. Needless to say, this did not instill confidence in the scientific community or my paleontological colleagues when we say, well, we estimate between 3.8 and 13.7 million years for the split based on genetic evidence. Um, and many of them just outright dismissed us. It was actually rather hard to get grant funding to do some of this work when some of it was weak. So being friends and drinking buddies with many paleontologists, we put together what we hope was a pretty reasonable, and this isn't even meant to be read, this is illustrative. Um, we looked at the fossil record of the stem Caterines, the common ancestor of apes and old world monkeys. We looked for the oldest old world monkey. We looked for the oldest ape. And we put together what we thought were relatively strong, undisputed estimates for those dates. From our genetic data, we calculated a tree. It's very clear in this tree 
that, and so time goes along this axis, that the apes are evolving more slowly on average than the old world monkeys. So we had to take into account that really complicated non-parametric Bayesian approach I had skipped over to calculate better estimates for these using a few, so we said human and chimp probably split around six million years ago, orangs and uh, humans and chimps and gorillas around 14 million years ago, and old world monkeys and apes around 23 million years ago. We felt confident about these dates though because we did a second experiment and I'm going to give another example of one of these experiments and that is in using, you always have today, you always have the zero time, zero difference point but we had the human chimp difference, the gorilla chimp human um, and orang difference and then the old world monkey ape differences that we could calculate genetically and we said if you use the six million year old difference for human chimp what do you estimate for this and what do you estimate for this and vice versa for all the different combinations they all fall I mean any biologist would kill for a regression line with this tight of a fit so no matter which calibration point we used, we recovered the other one. If one of these calibration points was wildly off the mark, one of these guys or two of them would fall way off this line. So we felt very confident about this. But it told us human and chimp was approximately six million years ago. And that allows us now to use our molecular data to begin to infer other things. So if your human chimp split is restricted to approximately six million years ago, it would mean a seven million year old fossil is not a human or a chimp, it's prior to that split. And a 4.5 million or a 5.8 million year old fossil would have to be on one or the other lineage. It should, these molecular estimates, if you can believe in them, restrict your ability to hypothesize things outside of those estimates. Molecular data, I'll give a very brief example, also allows us to infer when all modern humans split because we can measure all of us on the planet and infer back to our common ancestor. As many of you may have heard, we have now sequenced multiple Neanderthal DNA sequences and in fact within the next three months the complete three billion bases of the Neanderthal genome are about to be published. So we can infer issues about when Neanderthals last shared a common ancestor and as our closest relatives when Neanderthals and humans shared a last common ancestor. And again, this is going to place some constraints on our interpretations of the fossil record. An example of that is the fossil hominin or hominid auroran tugenensis, which dates to just about six million years ago. So the original discoverers, uh, Mark, Martin Pickford and Brijou Sanu, actually proposed that this fossil, this six million year old fossil, was a bi fully bipedal hominin that was directly on the human lineage. In fact, closer to us than even Lucy and the other Australopithecines. But in this is their figure, that would push the human chimp split back well before six million years. On the other hand, if you are willing to at least concede my view that maybe this split is only six million years, it's going to constrain your interpretations of Auroran. Auroran may indeed be a hominin right here, but it's no longer presumably definitely along the Homo lineage itself to the exclusion of Australopithecines. This is just one example. Artipithecus, beautiful specimen. 
I mean, this is four point, uh, over four and a half million years old, almost as complete as Lucy. It tells us about bipedality and all sorts of aspects. But in fact, I, I hate to say, it actually, since it's within that six million, and it's on our lineage, it confirms hypotheses about early bipedality and all this stuff, but it's not a new groundbreaking thing. But not all science is groundbreaking. Confirmation is as important as unconfirmed new hypotheses. So as, as much as I admire the work that went into working on Auroran, it's real solid confirmatory science, not groundbreaking new things that changes the human family tree, if you will. So the next example I want to just very briefly give is directly within our own lineage in dealing with ourselves and our Neanderthal cousins. So again, we are now on the verge of the era of Neanderthal genomics. We already have 20 Neanderthal mitochondrial sequences. The whole nuclear genome's about to come out. In fact, we know from some genes that some Neanderthals were red-haired and light-skinned. But they're not from Northwestern Europe. They actually have an independent and different mutation that yields red hair and light-colored skin. So, you know, these aren't Scots or Irishmen, or Scots and Irishmen don't have Neanderthal genes in them per se. They just happen to look rather alike in their hair color and skin color. <laughs> I'm actually a quarter Irish and a quarter Scot, so I'm allowed to speak of them. Um, it turns out from mitochondrial and genomic data that we know, remember one of those earlier slides I said, we sort of have an average date of change and the most recent date. Well, for Neanderthals, the most recent date's probably around 400,000. The average date's probably 500,000. And some of the older dates might go back a little bit more. But we know that anatomically modern humans all trace back to less than 200,000 years. So if Neanderthals are back 370,000 years at least, unless they hybridized with modern humans, there are no Neanderthal genes on the planet today. And that's what I believe. My uh, senior grad student and I did an analysis of all the genomic data to date, and along with other people who have done similar things, conclude that there's been a complete and total utter replacement of the modern gene pool within the last 200,000 years and that Neanderthals did not hybridize with us. And certainly Peking man and Java man and Heidelberg man didn't interbreed with us. All modern humanity in fact, has a very, very recent common origin. Only maybe 200,000 years ago, the Neanderthals, actually a little bit less than that, but Neanderthals amongst themselves. If you want to think of, and I am not a person who actually believes in the biological concept of race, but I might attribute Neanderthals to be a different race. Um, they're a little bit less variable than we all are, but they lived in one single region of the world. We live across the entire planet. So we show a little bit more variation than the Neanderthals, um, but there's no Neanderthal DNA in any of us is going to be my best estimate. In three or four months, I either get multiple steak dinners and beers at the meetings or I am paying out on those bets with my colleagues about Neanderthal human hybridization. The next example I want to talk about is New World monkeys. 
And here's a place that has been very controversial for many years. There's two main hypotheses. We have some nice fossils of New World monkeys. The question is, are New World monkeys, all of the different lineages within them, extremely ancient, or are all living New World monkeys very recent, and all of the fossils we have from South America to date that are older than 20 million years ago, a long extinct side branch. I'm going to come out on this half in just a moment. So we have nice fossils. This isn't a tooth. I mean, we got skulls. We got limbs. And some people would tie some of these fossils over 20 million years directly to individual genera of New World monkeys today. Other paleontologists the nice thing about paleontologists, you put three paleontologists in a room, you put a fossil on the table and you ask their opinion, you'll get four opinions. But some paleontologists say all of these early fossils are outside the realm. Crown just means the living species. So that all the fossils are they're like the Paranthropines, the robust Australopithecines. They're a side branch of New World monkey evolution. So we said we can test this. So using those very same techniques, complete mitochondrial genomes, and then applying all those really fancy statistics, we actually came up with dates that suggests that all of the fossils, which are earlier than 20 million years, occur well before all of the splits of the living New World monkeys. So we think there were what are referred to as successive radiations. So a monkey rafted to the New World at some time before 25 million years ago, or a group of them, they diverged into a nice group of monkeys running all over South America and Central America. All but one of them went extinct, and only one lineage gave rise to all of the living ones. Humans have done this. Talk to Tasmanians, or the f unfortunately the few remaining Native Americans. They were swamped out by new invaders. Surely this has happened numerous times in evolutionary history. But we said, how confident can we be in that? So we turned the whole fossil calibration thing on its head. We said, what if we calibrate the molecular clock on our new estimates and then say, when did apes, when did humans and chimps split? When did orangs and humans split? When did old world monkeys and apes split? Well, so when we did that in this sort of complicated model, the darker shaded areas are what everybody would say are the reasonable estimates for those. But if we use dates for the new world monkeys that are too old, you get ridiculous answers like old world monkeys and apes split at 70 million years ago. We know that's not the case. So here we are attempting hypothesis testing by moving, by inverting the question and say, if we accept our current estimate, what does that tell us about other better known estimates? And we think they hold up at least PNAS published it. So, the last real question I want to talk to is, when did the primates themselves first appear? The oldest definitive primate fossil is only about 55 million years old. Ida the lemur is about 47 million years old. But there are slightly older um, fossils that are 55 million years. People have said, well, you have to go back older. Because, as I said, the fossil record, you just get 1% or less of what lived and are lucky enough to find. So the fossil record might go back many, many times older 
than it actually appears. And so many people have simulated this, estimated it, done all sorts of experiments. And some people say that the primates go back 80 million years or even 90 million years, well before the Cretaceous tertiary boundary when the dinosaurs went extinct. There are molecular estimates that are pointing towards 85 million years for the primate um, fossil record. Other mammologists have looked and said uh, the KT boundary is this black line here. Um, and uh, I lost track of the primates over the last few days. Hmm? 6.30, okay. So the primates go well back before um, the KT boundary. The question is 5 million, 10 million, 20, 30. Some people have suggested 120 million years for the origin of the primates. Um, other people have again said, you know, 70 to 100 million years for the origin um, of the primates. Again, with very old dates. If that is the case, you get 11 million years for the human chimp split. If you believe that, then you have no trouble you know, buying a 90 million or 100 million year origin of the primates. So um, here we see the primates. Here's 80 million years. So one of the mitochondrial genomic estimates is over 80 million years for this. My research group, our very most recent research, in fact, we submitted an abstract uh, about 6 o'clock today um, to a conference in which we looked at the complete mitochondrial genomes and data that I'm going to show you was uh, in a moment was just emailed me this morning. We looked at the complete genomes, all 3.3 billion bases of data, and come up with much younger estimates. We're around 70 to 72 million years, I'll zoom in here, for the origin of the entire order primates based on mitochondrial data. But that's just one swatch. Again, we have the rest of the genome. We have the other 23 chromosomes, at least in humans, um, and each individual chunk of those chromosomes. So my, my very, I mean, you're hearing it first, literally. I got the email this morning. Our point estimate for the chimp-human split is around 6.3 million years ago. Based on the complete genomes of humans, chimps, gorillas, orangutans, macaques, marmosets, uh, microlemurs, a galago, and a tree shrew, and a dog and a cat as one of our external um, calibration points, and everybody's favorite, armadillo. Armadillo, I, I worked for a while in Texas. Armadillo DNA is really easy to come across. You just got to drive to work. Our estimate for the origin of the order primates is, again, around 72, 73 million years ago. And this is based now on, this is just one single chromosome. It's, there's a lot of computation involved. Uh, if this talk was being held next week, I would show it to you for all 23. But at least from three chromosomes and the mitochondrial genome, I can say it's close, you know, close but not quite a cigar to the KT boundary, but it's not 90 or 100 million or 120 million. It's somewhere between 70 and 75 million. That's going to infect, again, our interpretations of the early mammalian fossil record. So if you get to go to extreme mammals on April Fool's Day, you can see what estimates they put forth for the origin of some of these groups. What does it tell us about Ida the lemur? Sorry, nothing. 
Uh, if so, the date is compatible with what they said, at least in the press. They said, oh, this is a human ancestor going back 47 million years. Well, better ancestors actually say Ida is indeed a lemur. And everything I've told you right now actually has nothing to say about that, unfortunately. But again, good scientists know when they don't know anything. You know, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, which I'm loath to do, you know, there's known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Um, it's really wise to admit the unknown unknowns. Uh, you can speculate on the known unknowns, as I've been doing tonight, and you can talk all you want about the known knowns, but stay away from the unknown unknowns. And that's really my ultimate message tonight. Thank you.